It's a brand built on speed and passion. Jaguar's history is steeped in sports cars and the performance. Sports cars bring the fame, but saloons pay the bills. If you looked at the importance of sedans versus sports cars, sedans were far more important for far longer. Cars built with pride from deep within the United Kingdom. Made in Britain, it's got the British name, proud it's got a British stamp. Now, one of Britain's most cherished marks must once again fight for its survival. Sedans are just dying out. And if Jaguar fail to evolve, they're going to die out. As the era of the saloon goes dark, the fate of the brand hangs in the balance. Jaguar's in a tenuous position. They can't make a mistake. The answer is to bravely build the unexpected. I said to the team, you know, we're going to create a Jaguar's an SUV. It's a risky change that goes by the name F-Pace. We're up there to win. There's no two ways about it. It's a sports car hidden in an SUV's body that just happens to have room for five. It's got that wave factor to see coming down the motorway. It stands out. A machine that goes 0 to 60 in 5.3 seconds with the whole family inside. I don't think you can get anything more iconic than the Jaguar brand. It's been around for many years, it's as British as you can get. And it's the best-selling vehicle ever made by one of England's most famous car companies. The Jaguar F-Pace. A machine built to save an entire brand. It's built in Britain, it's built at Solihull, it's engineered in Britain, and most of the guys working on the car are British guys as well, so it's a British product. Today, UK automotive manufacturing accounts for over a tenth of the country's total exports, and Jaguar, by itself, represents roughly 7.5% of all those sales. If you look at Birmingham or the Midlands itself, it's the home of the motor industry within the UK. 10,000 or more people that work here, and maybe five times that with suppliers, so it's really important for the area. Job security, British built. Well, everyone likes the bank to be bulging in the pocket, you know. The more cars they sell, the better the old bank goes, the purse is nice and full. So, yeah, it's all great stuff. It's a hefty wallet full of hard-earned paper that doesn't just support the Jaguar family, but also nearly a quarter of a million people throughout the local supply chain. We do well. Also, businesses around us do well. Small businesses, cafes, restaurants, sports places. What we produce and what we spend expands out to the rest of the country. Economic expansion that oddly owes its existence to the company's last dramatic rise and fall. When the German cars exploded in the 80s, Jag missed that boat, and they've been adrift ever since. In 1989, the Ford Motor Company buys Jaguar and for the next two decades tries to transform a luxury car maker into a volume seller. The darkest years for Jaguar were actually years that they sold a lot of cars, and they were the Ford years. And I think there was a fundamental misunderstanding about what makes a Jaguar so special. When the worldwide economy collapses in 2008, Jag's prospects look even dimmer. So we went through, obviously, the significant recession. The company flirts with bankruptcy, and some say even begs the British government for help. At one time, there was a threat that one of the factories would close down, which was bring the papers. A single deal changes everything. Indian conglomerate Tata buys Jaguar for £1.7 billion and kickstarts an automotive renaissance.
we have our tough times, but it's hard to get investing, investing in people, investing in technology, and I think now we're repaying that faith. We set about, about 10, 15 years ago to reset the brand, to get it back to where it should be, to the brand that I remember back in the 60s, the cool brand that professionals and rock stars and footballers draw as a car to drive. The brand's resurgence starts with the XF sedan, but culminates with Jag's first two-seater sports car in nearly 40 years. The F-Type. What a module that. And once you get to that level, there's things you must do. One is to continue, and continue with surprises for people. Just as the mojo starts coming back, the car industry radically changes again. The F-Type might be gorgeous and might be immensely desirable, but right now we're at a time where people just don't seem to care that much. They'd rather go buy an SUV with that same brand on it. Nearly overnight, the very type of cars that the company so successfully builds start going out of style. They're really good and they're really pretty and they're kind of off of everyone's radar. That's probably because sedans are off most people's radar. It's a dramatic shift, the likes of which the car industry hasn't seen in decades. Today, sport utility vehicles, or SUVs, outsell large saloons nearly three to one worldwide. Is SUV going to become the family car of the future? Probably yes, it is. It's uh, the new sedan in so many ways, and that's something that we have to work out and get ahead around. To keep the good times going, the brand is forced to rethink its very core. It is a very important, pivotal point. The stakes are high, though. They can really screw it up. Reimagining what's possible has been percolating for a long time. The story of FPs probably started the day I arrived here 18 years ago. Because the first question I was asked, should we do an SUV? Because Porsche just brought out the KN, and I just said, no, no way because I couldn't see that necessity at the time. Ian Callum is one of the world's preeminent car designers and the man charged with defining the future of the mark and perhaps even saving it. Ian Callum is one of the best designers there is. When you meet designers, they're so often really slick and in really tight pants and they just have this look. You look at Ian Callum and you're like, this is a car dude. This is a guy who just loves cars. One of the reasons why I personally resisted SUVs for so long was because every SUV is fairly generic. Years passed, I was constantly asked what was my thought of an SUV. And of course, the last four or five years became very clear even to me, as a sports car guy, that SUVs were very much part of everyday life now. So we set about it. Now, I know it's an exaggerated drawing because yeah. that's the way we do it, but the essence of this, we have to capture in the real car. The decision is both necessary and radical. The faithful react swiftly. When we first found out, you're surprised because that's not what Jaguar does. They do coupes and sedans. I had this volley in my head because Jaguar's brand is based around low slung, long things, and SUVs aren't low and long. It's something that automotive purists and big enthusiasts were saying, that's not Jaguar, that's not what they do. But they kind of have to. The thing I love about the car industry is nearly everybody on the planet has got an opinion about cars. Some people don't like them, a lot of people love them. The quest to redefine Jaguar starts deep within the company's highly secretive design studio. When we had the challenge to create the first SUV, we just had the right measure of confidence and, you know, just being very aware of the fact we hadn't done this before. The first order of business is to alter an SUV's historically utilitarian roots. The reason that SUVs didn't work before, they were built for functional reasons, the way they performed didn't really matter to people. No technology allows the car to actually be driven quite well, almost as quick as a sedan. I wouldn't say as quick as a sports car, but certainly in the realm. The team starts by examining how SUVs have always been done. 
We had to kind of follow the rules as we discovered them generically. And the first models were actually a bit square, a bit boxy. I said, guys, we break the rules for sedans. We push and pull, we try to get the shape right. We've got to do the same on this car. And the roof line has to have that sense of speed in it, which we love, and let it drop off. Not to infringe in the package, but to make sure that we get that sense of speed off the back of the car. The great advantage we had with this one was a new platform. We could determine where the wheels were, how long the hood of the bonnet was, where the windscreen sat, and where the cabin sat, and where the roof was. We could actually predetermine these without too much of a struggle because it was new from the ground up. And that's a pleasure that the car designers don't often get. The key is a new, lightweight, aluminium architecture. The idea of a new platform, a whole new genre, start from fresh, doesn't happen very often. Probably once or twice in a career, perhaps. We really had full control over where we position the wheels, the cabin, the overhangs, and that's really what gives Jaguars that sense of drama and movement, the fundamental proportions. The Jaguar bit had to come first. And I think that's how we were able to create something which proportionally is a little bit more exciting than a generic SUV. The public catches an early glimpse at the 2013 Frankfurt Auto Show. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight we're very proud to introduce a new Jaguar Intelligent Aluminium Architecture. The CX-17 concept puts the car industry on notice. Jaguar won't be going quietly into the night. I saw the concept and it was stunning. And I thought, as long as they build that gorgeous thing, I'm fine with it. The machine's shape wows the crowd thanks to some time-tested aesthetic choices. Very powerful bonnets on F-Pace with that central power board. This is a Jaguar signature and that's because Jaguar designers always shrunk wrapped the exteriors around the mechanical components. As you move around to the side of F-Pace, you can see you've got this lovely, powerful front fender. And you've got that crease that runs from the front bumper through the fender and then drops and washes out through the door. That's very much a fundamental part of Jaguar's sports car DNA. It takes two very long years for the concept to become reality. The only question is whether it's too late. For decades, Jaguar has battled to stay relevant in an ever-shifting automotive landscape. Now, the Mark faces its greatest challenge yet as it transforms from a luxury saloon builder into a high-end SUV manufacturer. We started that journey, and it was quite challenging, to say the least, not really knowing what would end up. To survive, the brand introduces its very first SUV, the F-Pace. The F-Pace really is the coming out party, the bell of the ball of the debutante. This is it. We're back. This is us. Stop looking the other way. The machine is an immediate sensation propelling Jaguar sales 83% higher in a single year. The F-Pace is 50% of Jag sales. That means that the F-Pace is selling as much as the XE, the XF, the XJ, and the F-Type combined. That is a salesman's dream. You hope for that kind of thing, and then you hope that it never, ever goes away, because that completely changes your company. Few places showcase the change quite like the Solly Hull Factory Body Shop, which is capable of producing a brand new F-Pace shell every 84 seconds. It starts when we put a simple barcode on the bumper beam at the end of the body, and then it works its way through the line, having all the parts applied to it. They've been building aluminum cars for a while, and they're into the lightweight benefits that that provides. The use of aluminum differentiates JAG while also hiding a powerful eco-secret. One third of the machine's weight is comprised of recycled metal. 
We also use an awful lot of recycled aluminium in our products and 80% of all aluminium that's been produced around the world is still in use today, so it's a fantastic material for us to use. The use of recycled aluminium helps the F-Pace shave weight, but also saves the planet. Reusing the metal requires 95% less energy than producing it from scratch. We're in our underbody area at the moment, so we have the front of the underbody, the middle section and the rear end. Each body shell is comprised of 354 individual parts, and each one is riveted and glued. Six hundred and sixty robots in the facility is total, which apply two thousand six hundred rivets using three hundred rivet guns. The rivets hold the pieces in place, but it's the one hundred and fifty three meters of adhesive that actually join the parts together. So we have rivets that hold the part in position and the adhesive that gives it the structural integrity. With the underbody completed, it's time to add the side panels. They start with the inner structural components. The underbody now has come into the first framing station, and the body side inners will be applied by the robot. Once the inner supports are in place, another set of robots adds the sexy exterior curves. We're on our Framer 2 line at the moment, so this is where the body side outer is now applied to the car. The robots aren't the only high-tech tools. Even loading the side panels is advanced. This is one of our latest pieces of technology we've introduced into the body shop. This loads up our body side pallets to the load window, so no human interaction needed. The parts come from the press shop, already in the pallet as a single part. The AGV goes and collects the pallet, delivers it to the line. The AGV, or automated guide vehicle, ensures a constant flow of parts. So we basically go from the press shop all the way through into our facility without another person touching it until we see it and inspect it on the end of line. Once the pallet arrives, another robot picks up a panel and adds the adhesive. So on this screen here, we can tell where the adhesive is being applied. The green tells us that we've got the correct quantity in the correct position, and that is measured on every single car. Once the exterior side panel is glued, it's moved into position and permanently riveted into place. <laughs> Aluminium isn't the only thing joined inside the body shop. Lynn came into the business to work for me when I was a group leader, and I suppose the relationship just flourished from there. Three years on, and uh, she's ready to pop. Yes, it's good. I think he might be a little bit harder on me than he is on anybody else. We spent great time together, and then... Go home together. The boss at home, I'm the boss at work. Yeah. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> at Solihull, family connections run deep. There's a lot of family inheritance. It's quite nice to know that your parents have worked here, or even your grandparents have worked here, and it does make it quite a family feel about it. My father worked here as a toolmaker, and I was an apprentice in the same section that he worked. A lot of people have family who worked here, brothers, sisters, husbands, wives, and children. My granddad worked here most of his life, and this is the job that ultimately gave them the house and lifestyle that they had, my nan and granddad, and it seems to be doing the same for me. The familial links help with morale, but they don't always fill the ranks. Finding qualified tradespeople is increasingly difficult. Now, I think we went through a phase where it wasn't fashionable to be in manufacturing. Some of those missing skills come from explosive places. Yeah, I was in the British Army for six years, toured Iraq and Afghanistan. Ex-military guys who have joined us have been very important filling that skills gap. It was daunting, to say the least. However, there's such a well-versed process in place for welcoming new people, and you go through the transitional period of training until you're comfortable and safe on your job. Safety and comfort often lead to passion and pride. I, I love it personally, how anybody could not be proud having a hand in building these pieces of art. I think it gives you 
some satisfaction seeing the products that you produce driving around on the roads with families in it. It really gives you an exciting buzz about the job you do. These days, the steadiest hum is the sound of finished body shells being sent across the Sully Hull campus to the paint shop. We're in the paint shop. We have a car going through here every 1.6 minutes. First, the bare shells are primed. We have five different colours of primers, which you can see examples of as they're coming through the booth. Next, the body heads to the base coat zone. We have two sets of robots applying base coat. One robot covers 70% of the vehicle, while the other robot spins paint at a higher speed to randomize the application. Working in unison, they paint the exteriors in one of 25 different standard colors. So all of the base coat and clear coat robots are electrostatic, so we charge the air around it to try and drive the paint towards the car. The robotic heads spin the electrically charged paint up to 70,000 revolutions per minute. Once the robots are done, dedicated craftspeople paint the interior by hand. And we're now into the clear coat zone. So similar to base coat, manual application on our interiors. Uh, exteriors done by the same type of robots. The shells head to the quality control line, where another set of artisans ensures that the paint job is flawless. Then it's time to send a finished body to the assembly hall where the most unlikely Jaguar ever will come to life in a matter of hours. Jaguar, a name that has resonated for nearly 100 years. Today, the mark is one of the United Kingdom's automotive crown jewels, and a brand that has successfully ensured its future, thanks to the radical decision to build an SUV. It's jarring to see them build an SUV. It's not traditional at all. It still hits you as different. While it may not be traditional, it is still extremely British. What makes the Jaguar British? It's the Lion, isn't it? It's the British car. It's the interior. It's the design of the car. You know, it's them little touches that the British people put in. Special touches installed inside the Solly Hull factory, where every day nearly 300 new F paces roll off the line. You can really touch and feel the history as you walk around the facility. She has had an awful lot of development over the last few years as well, and a lot of investment. The final assembly hall is 81,000 square meters in size. That's roughly equivalent to 12 football pitches. Inside these walls, 3,000 men and women put their hearts and souls into every machine. So we start at 6.30 a.m. on a Monday morning, and we finish at 6.30 p.m. on a Friday evening. So 24-hour continuous operation between those times. The facility features 202 stations on the main line, and they move fast. Every eight to seven seconds, a vehicle passes by, and the guards move on to the next one. The build starts when aluminium body structures arrive from the paint shop. As you can see, it's a bare shell, and the first thing we do is pop the doors off, and that's for quality and also accessing the vehicle for assembly purposes. Once the doors are off and out of the way, the craftsperson sets the stage for the actual build. 
And this is the very first part of the process. What we do is print a build card, which is effectively the recipe book for that vehicle. Scanning the build sheet alerts the rest of the facility to what's coming. And this really is a critical part of the process. It really sets the drum beat for the rest of the assembly process. If you look at this vehicle here, we'll see that this one is, um, I'm just gonna check now, let's go to, so this is the exact destined for Spain. To coordinate the different parts required for different regions, the team relies on a cutting edge solution. What we see here on this rack is what we call a blue box. And typically, a number of our components arrive in blue boxes. The blue parts boxes are sent from an automated warehouse next door. Called ASRS, which stands for Automated Storage and Retrieval System. It holds 181,000 blue boxes. It's like an in-house Amazon delivery system that's just in time, every time. Cranes automatically select the box of parts that's required, feed it through an overhead conveyor on the roof of the building, and drop it down this drop point right here. Once the part boxes enter the assembly hall, they're sent to a station in mere minutes. It's a very high-tech way to ensure that parts arrive in sequence. And they move a lot of parts. We can move 2,400 pallets of boxes per day using 10 fully automated trains. The delivery system is cutting edge, but the workforce goes back a long way. It's all over the Midlands. We've got people in here with 30, 40 years service, and people are quite new to the company, maybe 18 months. I've known some people who's worked here for 40 years, their children work here, and some of their grandchildren work here. Now. Roughly 28 years. I uh, started here when I was 16 on a, a government training scheme. The company said, yep, yeah, let's employ him, thank God, and I'm still here today. Craftspeople aren't the only ones who are thankful. These days, car enthusiasts are equally thrilled that one of the most famous car brands is still alive and kicking. A story that starts thanks to just one man and his dream. Sir William Irons is the father of Jaguar. He created the brand, he created the cars, he designed the cars, he was integral in creating all of them. Lyons launches the business in 1922 and successfully navigates it through not only World War II, but multiple periods of economic uncertainty. Eventually, the brand becomes known for blending lavish comfort with attainable high performance. I love the fact that Jaguar has been able to be sporty and luxurious in equal measure at any time in history. By the 50s, success on the track helps the brand become a household name. During the decade, Jaguar wins the famed 24 Hours of Le Mans five times. Jaguar. Remember them? 1951. First, 1953. First, 1955. First, 1956. First again. Hugely, hugely proud of our heritage and our history. The sports cars build the image, but it's the saloons that keep the company in the black. If you mapped out Jaguar's history, sedans were far more important for far longer. I think the big breakthrough for him was when he brought out what we call the 2.4 in the 50s, which retrospectively is called the Mark I. That was more of an affordable sedan. The Mark I looks similar to the earlier Jaguar saloons, but it's the first machine with unibody construction. It features an independent front suspension with double wishbones, coil springs, and a live rear axle. The Mark was very popular all around the world because of its drivability and its size, and it was just right for so many people. In 1959, the brand introduces a mid-sized saloon follow-up called the Mark II. The Mark II is one of my favorites. Beautiful old sedan, very swoopy, very pretty car. It's very beautiful. Nine years later, in 1968, the last saloon Sir William Lyons ever works on arrives. 
It's called the XJ. Jaguar XJ6 sedan, a truly well-made luxury car for around $9,000. Move forward a few years and you get to the XJ6, 1968, my personal favorite. But his favorite car today is his latest, the Jaguar XJ6. How involved personally have you been in the design and indeed the manufacture of your cars? Well, of course, having been involved in the organization from the very beginning, I've had to take uh, a part in pretty well everything that goes on. The XJ was successful because it sold in great numbers at the time, and it was deemed to be the best sedan in the world for about five or six years, that's a fact. The XJ evolves through multiple generations. If you look at a 1980 Series 3 XJ6 today, it is drippingly gorgeous. It's stunning. They've always had kind of their own style. They did things the Jaguar way, the British way, and not the German way or the American way. These cars have a huge influence in how we approach the whole ethos of Jaguar. But above all, they have to look better than anything else in the world. And that's what drives us, really. Looking good is a hallmark of recent Jaguar machines. Yet the introduction of an SUV challenges the faithful. I worried when this SUV came out. I thought, oh, great. Now it's just going to be some SUV that captures none of the magic of the coupes and the sedans. And I was completely wrong. The new machine is the culmination of years of research and development. You go after it, you push, you push, you push, you push all the way to the end because the automotive industry is relentless. There's always somebody trying to push the boundaries and your job is to push harder and faster than anybody else. It is indeed a relentless industry. Today, there are more brands building SUVs than ever before. Everyone is now jumping into the SUV game with these great brands. You have Porsche, Maserati, Alfa Romeo, and yet, this is the family truckster. To separate themselves from the pack, the team decides to take their hard-earned on-road luxury saloon knowledge and refocus it towards SUVs. It's built on Jaguar's new lightweight aluminium architecture, so some of the fundamental mechanical elements we had from that toolbox, if you like. Logically, it's very simple. Right? We're just going to take a sand and you're going to lift it up a little bit and voila, SUV. The best part is that it's an XF. It's their front engine rear drive sports sedan that's wrapped in an SUV looking body. <laughs> Battling the competition starts with tech, but almost always comes down to people. If you want to make a brilliant car, it's really down to passion. And we're really fortunate that we've got tons and tons of people in Jaguar that love the brand and love what they're doing. That auto affection forms a unique type of pride inside the Solihull factory. This company gets under your skin. The pe people have a passion for Jaguar, and it's not just a, a commodity. It's, it's something to be proud of. So what are you assembling on the powertrain? When you Colin were, Walton is the man leading the final assembly team. He's a 23-year company veteran who starts on the bottom rung of the ladder. My father works here. I started in the machine shop, so I was trained as a CNC set operator for actual components. And through many years, I've progressed to a number of roles in the, in the company. And I now look after Fon 72. A great honor. Prestige that's often put into action on stations like wiring harness install. We preheat the harness to around 75 degrees, and that's for two reasons. It's good for ergonomics that people can manipulate what a supple harness. Secondly, we can get the, the harness in exactly the right position in the vehicle. Getting the harness into the machine is no easy task. If you were to lay out all of the pieces of harness end to end, you'd average around 5.8 miles. So to put that into some kind of perspective, to sum it Everest is 5.4 miles. So this harness end-to-end -end was summit Everest. Okay. 
84 seconds later, they install the rear tailgate. The brake booster is mounted. Coil springs. And the brake pedal is installed. Then the rest of the interior starts to take shape. What the guys are doing here is actually using the assister, which takes the weight of the cockpit, and putting that into the vehicle, and they're about to secure that. That hoist helps the team fasten the dashboard. But to secure their future, they've developed an in-house apprenticeship program. Yeah, we've invested heavily in people. We've invested heavily in graduates and have healthy graduate programmes and graduate placements. We're trying to shadow a skilled engineer and learn what I can for the future, hopefully, where I'll be a skilled tradesman. Just in this part of the factory alone, we have 27 active apprentices on a five-year learning journey with the company. I grew up in London, but I had to move specifically here for this job. Learning about the heritage, glad I could do something for England. A third of the way through the build, the machine is finally ready to receive its seats. Uh, work on the seat load on the line here. Basically, as you can see, the track's moving. We've given a set amount of time to get the seats in and complete our process for the next person to start. At the end of the line, the machine switches to a hanging carrier. We now put the vehicle into a carrier, and the way we achieve the flexibility of manufacturing is that this carrier is height adjustable. So as you look down behind me, some of these carriers move at different heights and that's the different operations and different vehicle types. In addition to the 202 main stations in the final assembly hall, there's also another 101 additional sub-assembly stations, including the powertrain line. So this is actually the powertrain assembly area. So what you see behind me is a, a powertrain for an F-Pace. Powertrains built 30 miles away. Inside one of the most advanced engine facilities in the world. The Roaring Cat is coming back thanks to the decision to build an SUV for the very first time. But becoming a true Jaguar requires a bit more than just a sexy shape and a handsome interior. Everybody in the UK has a passion for Jaguar. We're going back to the heyday of motor racing and the success back then. For years, the brand's ply and trade is pairing British elegance with powerful engine performance. V8, V12, they sound very exotic. I love V8s. I mean, the sound of Malone sort of just draws you into the very, very soul. But things are changing, and now we can create four-cylinder engines that are just as powerful and they're much more efficient. To take control of their destiny, Jaguar designs a new range of four-cylinder, high-efficiency engines. We're just launching our new four-cylinder Ingenium petrol engine. So we've got a 200 PS spread of power from the entry-level diesel to the highest power petrol. Few things in the car industry are as costly as designing and building your very own motor architecture, but the payoff can be enormous. Their own engine really gives the brand some more credibility, and it allows them to say, yeah, this is our engine, and there's a point of pride in that. Engineering a new power plant is one thing. Manufacturing it is quite another. For the past two decades, the company outsources its engine building. But all that changes when the brand opens the Wolverhampton Manufacturing Center. That sort of capital investment is deadly serious. There's no turning back now, you know. We're creating a whole family of engines and the infrastructure to build them in a way that would have seemed inconceivable 10 or 15 years ago. Wolverhampton is a one billion pound investment that creates 1,400 new jobs on site 
and another 5,500 in the regional supply chain. Here at the Engine Manufacturing Centre, we manufacture the new Ingenium engine. It's a two-litre petrol and diesel, four-cylinder, lightweight, new architect engine. The facility uses the best tech for each specific job, and the 150 workstations use a mixture of manual, semi-automatic, and fully robotic solutions. Our Ingenium engine is the first of our in-house engines that we're manufacturing. But to be part of bringing engine manufacturing in-house after two decades is just a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. The word Ingenium is Latin for innate talent, yet much of the aptitude on display is completely homegrown. Classroom environment was it for me. I like practical, hands-on stuff, so for an apprenticeship, 8,000 people apply, so they were really proud of me achieving it. If you really believe in that old-fashioned equation that better people equals a better business, then you should focus a lot of your time, your effort, your money, your resources into making people better. We embarked on an apprenticeship programme right from the very beginning. The best part about working here is all the knowledge and experience I gained. An engine's journey begins in the milling hall, where they machine the cylinder block, heads, and crankshaft. We are currently in machining, so module one machining factory, and this is the crankshaft line. The raw crank is milled to remove excess material using a giant multi-tool disc. It's got 42 different tips on each wheel, and each wheel does each half of the crank. We actually machine some of our components within five microns. You know, if you think that uh, the average thickness of a hair on your head is about 100 microns, you know, it's 20th of that. So we're manufacturing some very precise tolerances. The disc features a man-made diamond bit. When it's done cutting, it's sent to a 1,200 degrees Celsius oven to harden the metal. Then the crank gets polished. Across the hall, engine blocks are heated as well. This expands the metal just enough to allow a robot to insert cast iron liners into each cylinder. When the block cools down, it creates a perfect fit. Eventually, the milled blocks, cranks, and heads are all sent to the assembly hall, where they produce 1,200 engines a day. The engine assembly, it's split into 15 zones, and it goes through those 15 zones until it builds up into a finished engine. Crankshafts are prepped and then paired to their engine blocks. A few stations later, the crank is installed using a hoist. Pistons are sent to the line, ready by hand, and then robotically installed. Camshafts are installed. Then heads are placed on the engine, Finally, the turbocharger is added. I run Zone 13, which puts the wiring harness on the top. I was born here in Wolverhampton, so I'm a local lad from around the factory. For somebody to bring something so prestigious to my area, it was fantastic. A fantastic feeling that comes with a lot of responsibility. If we don't connect those connections properly, the heart of the car doesn't work. I haven't always worked in engine manufacturing. I was a bakery manager before I came here, so I worked for a major retail company producing bread and stuff, so it's a major career change. Even my kids know I work for Jaguar Land Rover and say, look, Daddy, you've built part of that car. It's a great feeling. All of those wires are verified in the cold test cell. 
It checks the electrical connections on the engine, intake and exhaust pressures, the overall functionality of the engine, just to make sure there's no particular issues with that particular engine. A critical investigation that takes just 154 seconds. It takes even less time to feel the pride running through the engine shop. It's such a proud moment to think that I've had a part of putting an engine into a vehicle, such a luxurious vehicle. So, you know, it's such a sense of pride and achievement. It's really rewarding. Finished engines are shipped 30 miles down the road to the Solly Hull factory. We're now at engine receipt. This particular sequence is a diesel engine destined for an F-Pace. Powertrains are built up and then sent to the main line for a very special union. So we're now at body marriage. So this is really where the vehicle gets its powertrain, gets its heart and lungs. After the powertrain is bolted in place, they install the steering wheel, headlights, and the iconic Roaring Cat front grille. I think it's fascinating, all the different people and, and different lines and how the car starts off as a shell and gets driven off at the end of the final line. It's something someone has to see once in their life. It is quite mesmerizing. Cars are the most complex things that people buy. Even, you know, your house is more expensive, but your car's got 30,000 parts in it. These days, people expect that everything in the car is going to work perfectly every single time for 10 years. So we're now at the end of line seven, so we're getting close to the finished vehicle. What we see here, though, is another example of innovation. The, the innovation isn't just about the, the multi-million pound investments and ideas. The innovation comes from our people. Then we can see Paul and his little chair going about his process. And what the guys here did was created that design themselves. So they went up to the seat supplier, get a seat that was going to be thrown away, and put the seat into the plant, and then our tool shop actually manufactured the chairs. Soon, the wheels and doors are installed. So this is the exciting part. We're at the end of line eight. So 202 assembly stations, 101 sub-assembly stations, 347 processes later, and the vehicle's about to be started for the first time and driven off. Oh, it's fantastic. It's, it's like the big Jaguar roaring, and it's, it's a great, great feeling, thinking you're the first person that started that car, and it sounds beautiful. When the machine rolls off the line, it looks ready to ship, but there's still an entire battery of tests to go. The vehicles come from the production line, goes through a rolling road where it tests the functionality of the vehicle. It takes three hours to review every part of the vehicle. This car goes to the US, United States of America. There's 137 markets. It's an achievement. It's not just an achievement for me, but for all the team. When, when I see one of these cars on the road, I'm thinking, well, I'm part of that. I'm part of putting that car there on the road, and I'm really proud of that. Very proud. I remember seeing the first ones coming down the track and instantly fell in love with it. Working with the cars all day, every day, you sort of take it for granted a little bit. But when you're actually abroad and you see them with a the customer and the customer's got a nice smile on their face, hopefully in the sunshine, you know, that's, that's a nice feeling. You go, hey, we built that. The reason why you meet so many lifers is we all fall in love with the brand. We're all on this journey to, to make the brand what we think it deserves to be. A journey that blends sophisticated luxury and high performance with surprising attainability. We do like to think Jaguar sits in a place where we have this sense of exotic, but an attainable exotic, and I think that's very important for the brand. Base F-Pace models start at £34,000, while higher spec versions top out around 52000 But I think what they succeeded at was making an SUV that fits so well with what we all hold so dear within Jaguars. It's gorgeous. It drives like a million bucks. It's a lot like driving a Jaguar sedan. You're just, you know, in platform shoes. You're just sitting a little bit higher in traffic. This is a vehicle that you want. It's sexy, and it's fast, and it's, it's an SUV, and it, it does all the things that you want it to do. One of the keys to the machine's adaptability 
is its advanced four-wheel drive tech. Jaguar's all-wheel drive system is very simple. It is a front-engine, rear-wheel drive car that has the ability to fade in the front axle. So by default, it's a rear-wheel drive vehicle, and it can lock clutches that send power to the front wheels. The all-wheel drive system is simple to use, but complex where it counts. It can anticipate a loss of traction in just under two-tenths of a second and adapt accordingly. The result is a machine that can conquer a surprising breadth of landscapes. Everything in the automotive world is moving to this homogenous solution, and charm comes from the outliers. And every once in a while, Jaguar pulls off this outlier charm that no one else can beat. Today, the brand is riding higher than ever before, thanks to the F-Pace, a gamble that's paid off. You hate to fall into the whole drama of it, of, oh, if this car doesn't succeed, it will spell the end of Jaguar. But it would have. But it really would have. If F-Pace missed the mark, then I think the confidence within the business would fall very quickly. That, to me, was really the biggest danger, is that we'd fail ourselves. At first, it was sacrilege, but ultimately became destiny. The Jaguar F-Pace, the most important machine ever built by one of Britain's greatest motoring marks, and the key to its continued renaissance. If you get up early on a Sunday morning, you can enjoy driving the car on the great roads around here. But at the same time, you can get five adults in the car. It is the ultimate practical sports car. If you think of Jaguars as old man stodgy cars, they're actually really all about the driving experience. And that F-Pace nails it. Nails it. Rides well, handles well, drives like a million bucks. All right, who are we to complain? I see them every day. It's remarkable. If somebody had asked me 15 years ago, you can drive down the road and see Jaguar SUVs everywhere, I just said, no, I don't believe you.